Good evening, everybody. How's everybody doing? Looks like we have uh, Gil's evil twin is in the house. Old school prepper, Flynn, Clan Wolf, and Kaelin Strain. Old man just walked in at Michael 58. How are you guys? Hey, everyone. What's up? Right. Okay. Get everything sorry. fired up there, Gil. I got everything but the one, so. Old oh, man. I am old. I got everything but the one, so. I got it. It's not me this time. I got it. I got it. <laughs> I got it, old man, right here. Okay. Oh, just wait for you. Grab I'm awake. When you gotta go, you gotta go. I guess. Uh, we're waiting. I'm gonna. Uh, we're kind of waiting on Howie, but we can start without him. Gil wants to put his cowboy hat on. Go for it. Got to get my straw hat out there, on. He wants to be yeah, farmer. Uh, farmer, the sodbuster. No problem, Martha. Hopefully, you can catch the re replay. <laughs> So we're supposed to be talking about uh, pests. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody in the side chat had decided we would talk about pests in your garden. Oh, pests in your garden? I uh, just pest infestation. So I was going to say, hey, we got a whole bunch of those in Washington, D.C. Oh, uh, yeah, no kidding. <laughs> <laughs> On so both sides of the aisle. Anyway, your garden. Garden. I got many, many months. I'm going to show you guys my intake here and see if I can get it up there. This is some um, uh, pictures of the pests that we should be talking about tonight. If you guys can see that, can't see it. Uh, tell me, and I'll enlarge it a little bit. But most of us know what most of the pests look like in our garden. Here's a good one right here. That's basically what we're looking for. And there are solutions that you can make, home remedies that you can make to make sure that these guys stay out of your way. I think the one I read up on that was the most, uh, most one I read up on was the one where you put a little bit of soap in the water and some vegetable oil and you mix it. I believe it's uh, one cup per gallon. And then you put that in one of those five gallon sprayers, can sprayers, and you just pump it up and start spraying your garden area. And then the stuff in the sprayer, it kind of uh, layers into your uh, garden stuff. And then when the, as the insects decide to come out, then they start munching on that stuff and it kills them. Or that's, that's how I read the article anyway. Oh, that's not a ladybug. Uh Feelin Clan Wolf. That's a uh, oh, the pain in the ass uh, Japanese beetle. It's like a beetle, and those things hurt. Yeah. Like if you look on, on the other pictures, there were some ladybugs on the other pictures he had up there. I saw those too. Yeah, I was, I was gonna say something, but somebody beat me to it. Yeah, See, there's, a, there's a ladybug up there. Here's some bad bugs. It's, uh, let me get that bigger for you guys. Yeah. Yeah, the, uh, the Japanese beetles are horrifying. I hate them. Yeah. Every yeah. year. Yeah. Yeah. Aphids. There's an aphid up there in the top left. Yeah. I aphids are terrible on my garden anyway. Yeah. yeah the white fly is the biggest thing when you have problem. We got aphids all over the place in California, but we got ladybugs all over the place, and we got praying mantises all over the place taking care of the aphids. It's the white flies that leaf miter those are terrible too because they look just like your leaf and it's yeah. hard to spot them well the the thing that bothers me is the the ladybugs eat the aphids so i like having them around but the aphids have got this little drug deal going on with the ants so the aphids will bite into the plant make the little sappy milkiness come out of the plant the ants harvest that and yeah. They protect the aphids. So when the ladybugs yeah. try to eat the aphids, the ants attack the ladybugs, and it's like hor horrible. Yeah, yeah la ladybugs are actually good for some parts of your garden, but yeah, not well, others, you know. Yeah. A ladybug, great. Keep them around as much as possible. Yeah. 
Ladybugs, ladybirds. Yeah. The uh, yeah, there's some uh, other little ones interesting that um, besides the uh, there's ooh. one we all know of right there. It's a slug. It's a slug. Luckily, I don't have very many issues with that, but I'm sure in the Pacific Northwest they have some hardcore slug issues. Now, uh, well, um, I was watching, reviewing some of the uh, channels from back uh, in the summertime, from uh, back east and uh, just south of you. They had a big problem this last year with um, squash bugs. Squash. Oh, I hate. Oh, yeah, Anthony had problems with squash bugs, too. There's those of me right there. Something no, that's, that. that's uh, slugs and snails. Yeah, that's slugs and snails there. Squash bugs are horrible. Oh, my God, I hate them. Yeah. I'm trying to think. Uh, rocking, scene, ho, rocking C, as in the letter C, Homestead, um, posted a video um talking about a commercial a natural um um uh, insecticidal soap that's uh, commercially made that is guaranteed to work on squash bugs With the best you thing i've found so up here, let me know what would you say anthony uh anthony froze up anthony frozen yeah, squash the squash bugs got to him. There he is. You me? All right, sorry. You started to say uh -huh. squash bugs. The only the thing that I've really found that's been really good at at getting rid of them has been companion planting and ensuring that you're bringing in beneficials to eat the squash bugs. So not only do you have to bring in or you have to plant things that squash bugs don't like, like nasturtium and dill and uh, radishes, like if you're doing your cucumbers and squash, but you also wanna make sure that you're uh, planting things that bring beneficials in. And if you have any other choice, go get some tape, wrap it backwards around your fingers and look underneath every single one of them leaves for little yeah. dots. You see and the little dots? Little aphids, right? No, that's squash bug eggs. Squash bug? Yeah. yeah. I know, uh, what are those stick? things called stick bugs you can buy them in like uh when they're babies and you just kind of lay them out around your garden and when they mature and start popping up and they'll go around and eat all your bugs what are those things called praying mantis praying mantis praying yeah. yeah those would be another good thing yeah you can buy on amazon even you can get the praying mantis um um egg nests, as well as uh, you know, a, a, a plastic container full of uh, baby ladybugs. And as soon as they start hatching out, you open it up. And... Yeah, the ladybugs are definitely all about eating some of those aphids and aphid larvae. And uh, the only thing bad about praying mantis that I've seen is they eat everything. So they don't yeah. just eat the, the bad bugs, they eat the good bugs too, including bees. Uh, There's so... something about that, yeah. yeah. It's to so, your advantage to get them to clean up your garden, but at the same time, sometimes they clean up more than just your garden and you don't have anything left. Hey, Steve. Yeah. Hey, Tibor. Hello, Texan. What's up, Bill? Yeah, we got Deborah. Catch it by me. Oh, there wait. Here. Howie, let me get back over there and get Howie up here. Yeah. Hold on, Howie. I'll get you a link, buddy. But yeah, there's a what you know, um, Anthony. Do you have much problems down there with um, the tomato horn worm? Link there, uh, Howie. With the what? Tomato hey. horn hornworm. All the time, at all the freaking time. Okay, and I, found some, I found something that works on it. It's a plant called borage. Oh yeah, he's borage all the time. Yeah, plant it around your um, mm -hmm. um, tomatoes. We had the, my uh, wife. My wife did that last year. We had no tomato hornworms. Basil and parsley also work to confuse because what it is is a moth and it's a larva. Uh, the only drawback is with the potato or the tomato hornworms, they don't just attack tomatoes. They go on peppers as well. Any, any nightshade. So yeah. you have to 
look for them. And the thing is, they're green, so they blend in. So you got to look for their poop. Yeah. The little black dotted poop. Yeah, the little so. little. All right, everybody, say hi to yeah. Howie. Hey, hey Howie. Howie. What's going on, Howie? Well, oh, I just got in the door, and I'm like running for the computer. <laughs> yeah, I knew Will was on. So. Yeah. Yeah, but so uh, I, I almost didn't make it, but I made it. Like, yeah. yeah, I went to your channel looking for your email address, and I couldn't find it. So I figured, well, I'll find him when he gets in here. Yeah. So here's uh, there are several recipes on this one here, and I'll put back ah, it out of there, and I'll post the links to to the, to this one and another one here, which gives different recipes for different types of natural um, insecticidal soap sprays and so they got different ones here how to how to make it how to use it so i'll throw I'm those up there for you guys to uh, look at it and then again you can also there's um you know different ones here and then you can there are some uh ones uh that are uh claiming to be you know totally you know safe and everything else I'm a I'm a big fan of bringing in beneficials instead of using any kind of insecticidal yeah. soap just because I don't want to you got to figure a lot of plants are, are you know bees you don't want to mess with the yeah. bees either so a lot of people use the uh, you know yeah. the sprays and they think that it's just going to get the bad bug uh, it gets the good bugs too so if you well, just bring in if you just bring in and plant good things for the good yeah. insect They'll patrol and keep all the bad stuff away. Yeah. The, um, my wife, um, well, a friend of ours up the street is uh, just retired as the horticulture director at the Apple Valley College. I mean, she goes, all, she goes down to Australia and other countries and gets special permits to bring special plants back in. And, oh, no. And, <laughs> and uh, they, they study to make sure they're not going to become evasive. And, if, and they get approval to, to then to give, give them away if they're not evasive. And everything, and um, she is big into a uh, one that they developed there a, a recipe. I don't have it. My wife does for a uh, insecticidal soap that doesn't get everything. It gets the aphids and it gets the white flies and something else, but everything else it leaves alone basically because it's not the, like most of these common ones are. And we, she, my wife was using that planting borage around. Planting the um, oh, I just forgot the name of the uh, orange, little orange orange flower, um, marigold, marigolds, and plants don't like marigolds. Yeah, the only thing that uh, and then you know so she plant she was doing that, got rid of all most of the aphids, got rid of most of the white flies and stuff. So much so that when the county came by with their traps, first time they tried hanging a trap in our tree, they came back by a month later and there was no white flies in the trap. And they go, oh, well, you don't have white flies in there. No, we kill them all. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. So, you know, you know, she, uh, we also brought in a bunch of ladybugs and a bunch of... I like ladybugs. Um, they eat aphids. Yeah. And mm -hmm. uh, praying man we ordered, I think, a couple things of praying mantises. Yeah, they're good. They eat other bugs. Yeah, everything. Yeah. But we yeah, didn't like bird. have... Birds eat a lot of bugs. Yeah. We oh, had... Bird so bird Praying mantises, and sometimes they eat too many bugs. Yeah, but we had that can happen. So many bees around, and when they were in the borage, this is something I've never seen before. Usually, the bees are really agitated around our, our all our stuff. They don't want you to get near them. When they after they've been in the borage, I mean, they're like drunk bees. They're just all mellow, and you can walk up there, they'll just fly away. They don't come after you. So, hey, my bee bomb. That's how they do when they're around the Monarda. They don't. Uh, they get all up in that, and they don't care about you. You can get up on them. Almost, you can touch them. They don't care. Yeah, they're like that on La La Land. Uh. What, 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 what land was that, Anthony? What's that? It's uh, it's called Monarda or bee bomb. I did a video on it. Uh, okay, cool. Ago. I'll look grow, it up. Grow mint if you're living out out like off grid. There's a lot of deer. You don't want ticks. Just put patches of mint growing in a few places. And ticks won't come there. Yeah. Something to remember if you're out in the bushes, carry some mint oil on you too. A little mint oil really yeah, helps. Like yeah, I got a big uh, 12 ounce bottle of mint oil. 
Yeah. It, keep, it, it keeps the paper the uh, paper wasps away. Those as well. The tick can bring you Lyme disease, so, so that's yeah. why it's important to keep. You just put a few sprigs here and there. You pull it up. It's a, it's a rooted, the mint and spearmints are little long roots on the ground. Pick that up and just cut it in little two or three inches early spring and put it at different places around your house and let it grow on the ground. You'll never have a you'll never have too many bugs at all because they don't like the smell. It, it gets on yeah. them, and mice don't like it either. Thank you, Tyler. I appreciate that. Oh yeah. Wood ash kills slugs. I put wood ash down in the spring, all over the property. I save it up, and then I, and I just put it all around and wear a little hole. And it's not so good for bees, but but if, if you put it out before the you know bees shows up, it gets into the soil. And uh, really so, does a, a lot of work on click beetle and wireworm because they they're they're related, and the, you know, see the click beetle he'll eat underneath and eat the roots. If you got if you got wood ash or biochar in that soil, they don't they don't do that. It, it's too rough for them to hang out there. Eh? If you got balanced soil, you won't have too many bug problems. Birds mm -hmm. take care of the bugs. You know, if you go with nature, you don't have to rely on any sprays or anything. You know what? I never spray here. I put a little oil on some of the domesticated trees I dragged home because the bark cracks. But other than that, I don't really do a whole lot. I put uh, clay and water in the spring because, you know, you got those landio pods, those roly polies or whatever you want to call them. Yeah. You know, you, they go into a little ball. Their landio pod is the Latin name for them. Anyway, they, they, they do a lot of damage up to crops. So you just, just you know, as they're coming up, just spray them a little bit with clay. They don't get eaten. And then it just slowly wears off. And the plant gets a gets a foliar feed, too. But then the bugs don't eat it either because it's too gritty. See? So then after three or four weeks, it's all washed off. And then you take it. And you eat it, see? That's <laughs> yeah, cool. Go with nature and you won't have problems. Neem oil, though, I did use a couple times because uh, because I had I had a, a small um, they're they're like a black aphid here. I did, I didn't like them. They didn't do too much, but I just didn't like them. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, but neem I oil's the other thing is good. Yeah, I've used that neem oil before. That clay and water protects your plants. Hey. Especially if you got grasshoppers coming or the plague like, you know, grasshoppers. They're gonna come and eat your crops, spray it with clay. Spray everything with clay and they won't eat it. They can't. It's too gritty. It's the only effective means to repel something like that. Clay plugs them up, huh? Well, they can't eat it. And it and it wears a hole in, but unfortunately it's not good for bees. Because uh -huh. the bee is moving to it, it wears a hole in him, and he can't really take the temperature loss. He dies and becomes <laughs> part of the soil. But we have 460 types of bees here. So uh, <clears throat> what I do is I use pollinators. And then the bees and wasps, I don't get rid of the wasp nest. I keep the wasp nest. That's your fighters, hey? They go and they kill other bugs like like and it, and they're pretty ferocious and they they work for free. There's no workers' compensation. You don't have the buy insurance. Well, what do you do with their, what do you do with their nests if it's up around your house? Don't don't disturb them. That's it. They're unionizing when they do those little nests. <laughs> unionizing. Don't, but I'll tell you, I seen them take the gypsy moth out. There was an infection. They were spraying this beet. TK or whatever around here and they were killing the gypsy moth. I complained lots because the birds were, I, I noticed that the, the little birds would go into the gypsy moth nest. Like it was a big ball of nest. You must have seen them where you live. And then they're all wiggling around in there. If you got bird nests around, they got to feed their young, hey? So they just go up and just grab them all and feed the young. It's because you don't have enough nest or enough cover to have birds there. You, it's out of balance. And this is why you have problems in nature. You have no balance. It's like if you're going to grow food, gentlemen, don't put it out in the middle of the field or the middle of the lawn and, and grow some food. You're just going, oh, look, here's the smorgasbord for everything. <laughs> you want to do polyculture and have balance. And I never have bug problems. Everybody says that, too, that comes here. 
like yesterday I had a professor from the University of Victoria here and she went around, she took a bunch of video of my lemons, stuff like that. She's like, wow, look at the soil. I'm like, yeah. And then she, uh, she comes here once in a while, every couple times a year sometimes. And uh, she, she was amazed at the soil and the balance. And she dug some soil back. And there's these okay. huge night crawlers, a 12 inch long night crawlers are just <laughs> being disturbed, you know. They're, they're like, it, was, it was funny to see. Yeah. I always do my night crawlers right back out in the garden. Oh, they're good for fishing, you know. And they get, they're all icky, you know. The, the stores, they don't feed them or nothing, you know. So yeah, I throw them out in the garden, let them munch out there, you know, and then when I needed a few to go fishing, just go grab a couple. You yeah, know? fishing big it's rainbow like trout. Big trout. Old, that one, you know, man. Yeah, I emptied a, a partial pathway soil bank today, and um, I did a video. I haven't put it up yet, but uh, it shows that the from five years ago when I made the video the first time making the pathway soil bank, and now it shows how I'm emptying it five years later is one that I had in storage that I didn't use. And it was all in layers, like in nature's layers, you know, layer leaves, layer twigs, layer dead bugs. And then every 10 years you get one inch of topsoil. Well, I condensed time, you see, and I got four feet in, and, and I did it five years ago. And I'm, oh, yeah. and I'm going to be putting up the, I, I just made one video and showed all the layers. Hey, yeah. And uh, yeah, because I, I I I put down the I put down the kitchen waste first. You want to put that down first, and then and then you want to put down the coffee grounds. Then you want to put down your wood chips, lawn grass, biochar, wood ash. And repeat, 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 yeah. repeat until you got it real deep. See, this way you don't make compost. You don't have to turn it and all that. I condense that. I don't want to do all that work. When I want to go get some real nice soil. And it's balanced. And when you when I dig out my soil, you can see the mycelium growing right through the soil. It That's what I did with an old bathtub I had. Yeah, I just kept piling it all up in there in layers. Yeah, like you were saying, and then after like a couple of years, I just go out there and get whatever I needed out of there. You know. Yeah, it's beautiful. It's all ready to go. You might have to adjust the pH, maybe like where I live. I have to because the cedar trees bring down needles that are are, are acidic. So even though you think, oh, I, I limed last year, but there's new now. There's new, yeah. new acidic. Oh, acid that stuff there. I had, I, if I dug down in there a little ways, steam would come up where it was so warm down below, you know. Yeah, that's nice. That's real nice. That's a that's a microclimate too. You can heat you can heat a greenhouse like that, hey. You just take yeah, it a bunch of bio and put it in the greenhouse. Do the same thing over and over again. Yeah. I whatever I was doing, it was right, you know. So I just kept doing it. Yeah. Yeah, I can buy. I can make like biomass uh, in about twenty-one days to four weeks here in the summer. In the winter, it might be a little longer, and uh, it, it makes it real easy if you if you uh, get into like a regimen and you change your regimen every day just for a few minutes. Like if you're going to the coffee shop, you stop at the coffee shop and you take their coffee grounds. And, and and Starbucks puts them out back for people to oh, yeah. yeah. So and then you got your leaves in the fall. So you make these layers. And then and then and then when you want soil, it's your soil bank. It's, and, and you can make you can make a huge one, take a week or two and make a huge one. And it's black gold. I mean, it's five bucks for 20 liters. That's about four gallons. Four or five hey. gallons. Hey, and Holly? it's not cheap. Uh, you're talking about the about the coffee grounds. Um, Good Simple Living was just was showing how they got there. I can't remember the name of the flowers they had, but when they put the coffee grounds on it, the flower turned bright blue. Yeah, that's a hydrangea. Hydrangea, that's it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's my favorite flower to sell because you know they're so easy to make clones and twenty five dollars a, a clone and you know you just have a few it's a little extra it's a money stream coming to you to pay for anything that you might need for growing food you know like like if you could train the people to bring their kitchen waste to you that green garbage can that's ideal that's ideal and then all the clippings what they do is they chop stuff in their property gardeners a lot do 
and they bring it to you. Train them to bring it to you and put it in the pathway soil bank. And then it gets built by itself. You see? So that saves the homeowner, two, well, where I am, $240 a year because the green bin doesn't get picked up. You get it taken off your land taxes. <laughs> hey, hey, there's benefits yeah, yeah. and you don't have to listen to that squealing big monstrous machine and run and think it's aliens man because it's noisy at my house when it shows up here oh my it's it, it it just i don't like it so i take all the neighbors hey i take all their 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 compost and then lots of neighbors bring it here but now i'm so full here i have about 500 yards on a half acre of rich black you can, you can turn around and sell that, you know. Oh yeah, oh I do, I do. When yeah. when people build a, when oh yeah, I, I'm building a nursery. I'm just taking volunteers in my local area of trees, and replicating them because they grow good here. I don't want to get into any fancy stuff. I want to do just air layer figs and stuff like that. Something easy. Yeah. Yeah, but soil is you can't get any better than yeah. free soil. And it can be made in your local area, bug free. The thing I don't like about compost, lots of rats show up for compost. With pathway soil bank, they don't show up because it, the, the kitchen waste is underneath two or three feet of, of rich black, you know, yeah. of soil. It, it, it goes to soil right away. You want to put your kitchen waste deep because that keeps away any. And you live in a city, not everybody's a good steward of their property. Some people have run down property, mice and rats live there. Well, that can be a problem or raccoons. So I got two little min pin dogs. I'll tell you when I let them go, <laughs> if something does show up and then I got an owl house, I'm going to do a videotape of it. I made an owl house out of a tall um, maple tree. So the owl always sits there and just can swoop in and feed. And we have owls here. I've got about nine varieties of figs, maybe 10. And then I have volunteer figs now that grow by themselves because of the seed. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, gardening's fun, hey? <laughs> yeah. It's easy, if you, if, it, it's easy if you go with nature. If you don't go with nature, you always have this battle, and it's, it's kind of depressing. You're going to have, uh, uh, have to fight the bugs. My apricot yeah. trees are blooming, and I'm in Canada. Yeah, yeah. I had I went out there with a little feather, uh, like this, to the next one because there's no bees, right? So I just get out there with a feather. It'd be like, like she, but uh, be the bee. <laughs> be like he, he drinks a lot of coffee, twenty four seven. It seems like you know when I when I see him online. So if he saved all those uh, coffee grounds and just pitched them out. In his backyard in the flower beds, he'd be looking pretty fat pretty fast. <laughs> yeah, wood chips are good from wood chip companies, hey? They deliver it free. All you got to steer clear of is laurels. One. Laurels and walnuts. Yeah, anything with tannins in it, you want to steer clear of when you're doing wood chips. That's number one. And then if your wood chips are hot, just put them in the pathway soil bank. Don't put it around your shrubs and stuff. That's what the pathway soil bank takes all biomass. And it's really good because people can show up with a lot for you, like the local gardener when he's doing prunings and stuff and you make a deal with them, don't put in any blackberry or anything like that, right? It's just clippings, and, uh, it's called chop and drop. And, uh, and, and, it's, and it's, you know, he bring that to you and put it there because it costs him to bring it somewhere. Same with the wood chip company. It costs them money to, to get rid of that, hey? And yeah. if you're doing work in your neighborhood, that's how I built a lot of these food forests and still do today, is that I direct the wood chip company and landscaping company to do, deliver it there. And then well, I... A lot of them up with the drop, water. You know, they open the tailgate and they just drop it in one big... Yeah, big that's the wood chips. Them. And you you got to yeah. watch wood chips. Alder can go on right away. Uh, you know, any of the round leaf deciduous can go on your garden right away, anywhere in a thin, thin layer. I've seen them things catch on fire before just because the truck dumped them all in one big heap. That yeah, they, so when that happens, the heat inside the chips actually caught on fire. Spread that out, and that won't happen. Yeah, 
Yeah, that's yeah. what I started doing. Yeah. Spread it out, and the sun solarizes all that and takes out a lot of volatile oils. Like if you got cedars to work with and stuff. But the sun, yeah. But biomass is where it's at, and it's in layers. And wood ash and, and the biochar is your best friend for, for all the bugs and slugs and whatever the problem is. Yeah. yeah. I do about yeah. five times a year with uh, white wood ash on a half acre. And it's just like a sprinkling. You don't need a lot. And then five times a year when I'm not in production. So when I'm coming into fall, I'll do it then. Mid-winter, I'll do it. Before spring, I'll do it. At spring, I'll do it. Like four or five times a year. You don't want to be doing that too much when you've got your vegetables all that you're going to be consuming. You don't want that. That you want you. That I don't do in too much for bugs or anything because I don't have that problem. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, my wife has a plan for when she comes up here to Idaho. Um, one of the things I got to uh, do the, the year before she decides that she's going to retire and come up here and join me is um, we're going to put build a what's called a chicken garden. And you have only a couple chickens in there, not a lot of chickens, just a couple. Yeah. And they go around and they do all the scratching and they go after all the bugs and stuff. Yeah. And they have enough bug seed that they don't bother the plants. Yeah. Um, yeah, you well, you, lime that, you lime that and then rake that and then come spring you can plant that. You can use um, chickens and, and move them around to do work for you. Hey, and same with with yeah. pigs too. Pigs will pigs will clean up an area or in goats. You got lots of don't get out there and and start chopping up all the blackberry and all that. That's you get someone with their goats to come over and clean up the understory. Hell and yeah, then, and, then, and then, like that, yeah. Uh, and then because the, you've incorporated the goat into the ecosystem and that and you, they wrote that, you know, if you own hoofed animals, sheep, whatever it is, OK, you should do rotational grazing. Now, and that way, if, if once it starts wearing down here, you move it here and this grows back. And what happens is water the, when it's growing back, when it rains onto the grass, it puts the water into the aquifer. You, you, you want that. That's part of nature. If you go with nature, it's real easy. <laughs> but if you don't, you're going to encounter problems like deer will show up or rabbits or there'll be an, a, 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 you'll be out of balance. If you've got rabbits and deer, long ribbon and red, orange and silver and white ribbon and put it about five or six feet long in the trees. And when it wiggles like this, that makes the animal startled. And then they leave. You see, you're only as smart as the animal that you're you're you're, <laughs> you're, 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 you're having a problem with, right? Yeah. I got deer here. But they don't come and bother me. They don't eat my food. I put a little stream there, and then and then they're gone. You see, because they don't. Like they use those they don't understand the yeah. turn that are all glittery. The the best thing I ever seen done to keep them away, it was another one with Set Holt, sir. And he's a, he's a mound builder over in Austria. He builds hugel mounds and does permaculture. And he burned bones on the, on the fire and made them mushy. And then where the, at the rabbit lead was or the deer lead, he put it all there wherever the beaver was. And he said they were just gone. They took one smell of it because they know <laughs> that that bone's burnt and they don't yeah. want to be next. Oh, See, no, I don't want to be next. Okay, yeah. that's it. Yeah. Hey, Farmall. Oh yeah, there was a lady asking about uh, about um, about uh, something there. I forget. <laughs> Heaven's Essentials asked a question, but I can't remember what she asked. The chat went by. So. She was asking about oak leaves in your uh, compost pile. The Don't one thing about compost. Oak leaves, yeah, yeah, they they break down fast. They're very nice. very long breakdown. And they're very high in acid. So if you have a very acidic soil anyway, you're just going to acidify your soil more. Yeah, you have a problem. Yeah. Lime. yeah. Yeah. Hey, how you yeah. doing, Farmo? Oak leaves can be used in making soil. Anything from nature that decomposes makes soil. That includes zombies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Zombies make good ones because their parts fall off. You know? Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right, uh, Anthony, you started yeah, to say something up? back there about the about the uh, chicken garden. 
from from experience now, you can have all the worms and grubs you want to. If you're growing something red, the chickens are going to go for it first. Sure, of so course. When it, comes, when it comes down to tomatoes, peppers, whatever, if it's red, the chickens will fight each other to get there yep. first. Yep. So, yeah. um, you know what you I may, do? You may stop them from yeah. digging as much, but you're, they're still going to jump after them with tomatoes all day. Absolutely. Yeah, my, I, wife, I my wife was uh, doing OG berries and I've yeah. held it up and they yeah. jump up and grab it. <laughs> yeah. My wife's been reading books on it and stuff and she's making a list of what plants to plant and she found out about the red stuff, not to plant red stuff. So she's planting the green stuff and stuff and she's going to have a second garden where the tomatoes will be at and stuff, but she wants a, a chicken garden where the chickens can go out and, you know, you know, with the herbs and stuff and eat all around that stuff and leave the, you know, they stuff alone, but well, keep all the you know, the bug some of the bugs away. If they have enough space, they're really not going to dig that much. It's when they get confined is when they really start to dig. However, um, depending on the type of whatever you plant, if there's a good earthworm population or a good beetle population, uh, depending on what gets laid where, because a lot of animals or sorry, a lot of pests will lay their larva at the base of the, the plant. Chicken so the food. next year. Yeah. So the next year that the larva will go up to the top and, uh, you know, get another snack. That's why you want to rotate your plants. Well, yeah. it's good for chickens because the chickens can eat them, but they like to scratch. So when they scratch, yeah. that's when they kill your plants. So if you want to, the garden is established first. Then yeah. you can let the chickens go all day. You really shouldn't yeah. kill too much. Yeah, she was, uh, yeah, she, her, th her thing she read, she says, uh, you know, most of the chickens will not be allowed in the garden. There's just to be a couple at a time that can go out there. That way, they don't destroy it. They just, you know, chicken tractor. scratch the soil a little bit and poop around and pe uh, get it, go after it. Yeah, she's said, you know, definitely you don't want to go over, uh, overpopulate the chickens for the size of the garden because then yeah. you lose the garden. The chicken I would check them to, yes, I would just check them, but I would check them to ducks because ducks don't scratch. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, Dr. Muscovy Duck, you should have that eat slugs. Hey, get get a couple of pairs, of and they eat the slugs. If you got slugs around and snails, right? You, it, it, yeah. it, but the chicken tractor is, is the best thing you'll ever build, and you just move it around every couple of days, and they make the soil right there for you. In permaculture, yeah. that's the number one thing to have is a chicken tractor because you can move it. Yeah, yeah, you just pick it up and move it. It's on wheels, and it just sets back down. You can go online and see the designs. They're very simple. And and then you move it around, and what the chicken eats and scratches, that's your disturbed soil, almost no-till. And you can plant a crop of kale on that or lettuce, but don't eat it right away. Make sure you, if you got raw like that, it's a good month or two before you, you eat anything from there. And let it, you know, let it biodegrade as much as possible because it's pathogenic, right? So you want that to lower. And chicken is about the worst pathogens you can get. So there is there is rules to the chicken tractor, but it solves the problem. What we do is we move the chickens in in the fall in the food forest, and it, and they take out all the understory. They just and it's and it, it, they just go through and eat everything. And that way, I don't know. And then when they're done, they're, they they go to the next place, and then and then we'll throw up a winter crop of kale or or celery or something like that, you know. So you don't have to do a lot of work. You don't, you don't when when you're growing food, you want to condense time. So what that means is, okay, you got a crop here growing the kale, lettuce. You want another crop right behind it when you cut this one down. It's condensing time, and you're you're continuously having a crop. With cold weather crops, this is what I'm talking about now, because that's what's coming up, and that's what you want to do. So if you if you plant some kale in a polyculture with lettuce and chervil and these things, the the bugs and stuff don't go for it because they're all mixed up in a polyculture. They're all mixed together. A few garlics here, uh, you know. Uh, the borage there, and it's not all in a line. And nature leaves it alone, and it does well. If you look at nature, it's not all monoculture. It's all one field of corn. No. <laughs> it Because then you, if you've got monoculture, they're not protecting each other. Polyculture is something to look into, gentlemen. 
It really is a balanced land and ecosystem land. So if you just um, have a, your average garden right now, how long would it take for a person to get the poly garden? Well, you plant the seed in a tray or you or you get your chickens to do it, the work for you. There's many routes to, to put the seed down. And you can be doing microgreens in a couple of weeks having that. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it all depends on what style like you like to do. Maybe you're a lazy gardener. Maybe you're an enthusiastic gardener. <laughs> it all depends on. Well, the that's why I'm sort of asking you that. You know, for the uh, people mm. out there in the side chat, say that they already have their gardens are already established, but they would like to go into an easier method of doing it. How well, would yeah. they go about doing that? You know, maintenance-free and waterless is what you want to go with. That's what you want. But it takes time. It takes time to get there. Yes. Nature has patience for you. And you have to have patience for nature. And when you build in layers, you build this giant sponge in the pathway soil bank. And that soaks up water in the winter. And then it releases the water, you know, evaporates or then the plant has transpiration whatever the usage of the water it disappears over time but you can get a, a couple of crops of, of cold weather crops off first in the spring because it's still moist so that's maintenance free where you don't have to go and water it and when you when you spread seed around like myself i call it gorilla growing and it's just when it warms up where it's not too cold for cold weather crops then i'll go around and i'll just rake it if i don't have a chicken i'll just rake it around but not too deep. it's called shallow tilling like about an inch or two and just rake it around and throw your seeds like really fast with your hand like that and then it just spreads and then just slowly move forward and then spread the kale because i i keep all my own kale so i have like 40, 50, 100,000 different seeds of all kinds of stuff. <laughs> so I can afford to just throw the seed. So, so the, a, nature, a Johnny apple the, moisture, seed the nature has the moisture to look after that. I don't have to water it. And I just come by and I cut it and eat it. See? You, 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 you're condensing time. So when I do that, I'll leave a few to grow. And then, then they grow. And then I'll weed that out again and eat them. Like uh, I'll make it. And so eventually you get a fully grown kale. But all the way through, you're harvesting kale. One after the other. You're condensing time. So important because when you want your carrots in the fall, you know you want to plant them because when they're cool weather crop, the same with spring, they're cool weather crop. Then there's hot weather crop. Hot weather crops, tomatoes and cucumbers and and watermelons that kind of thing it can't get cold so that's why it's called a hot weather crop and you once your cold weather crops are done there you can come in with your trays of hot weather crop and plant right behind it like in june, you you like where anthony, june. anthony's got that sort of like where he lives yeah he, yeah he that, can have, that, he can have like a, two growing seasons right anthony you can have what three growing seasons as I've long seen as you know what you can grow, you can just grow one behind another, right? Yeah, yeah. Like, Growing food's fun. You plant the spring garden, which is the cool weather crops. Those usually die out right around the beginning of May. And then you plant your warm weather stuff from May, June, July. So, most of the stuff dies in July, but the things like uh, cucumbers, sweet potatoes, okra love the heat. So they keep coming through. And same with peppers. And then right as it starts getting cool again in the beginning of September, then you can plant another crop of cold weather uh, stuff. But that's hit or miss because with all the rain we get, sometimes it gets washed out with the hurricanes and whatever. So Anything can happen when you're with nature. Pretty powerful. So you never know when it comes to your, your, your third garden if you're going to get one or not because most of the time it gets washed out pretty hardcore with a hurricane. But see, I've never lived in that corner kind of uh, part of the United States. I always, we only got uh, one growing season. If you're lucky, maybe half of another, you know, maybe. You uh, can uh, build a, a cold frame and extend a lot of season that way. Because uh, some stuff like spinach and kale, they love cold weather. They, they can handle pretty downright cold freezing temperatures. So you put a cold frame there and at least make sure they have some light away from the snow. You'll still be able to harvest uh, 
kale and spinach almost all winter. Yeah. That's how I got I had to get me a greenhouse to have two two complete grow cycles. Remade. Remade. You ever hear of remade? It, it's spun plastic and and it's spun into a sheet. And then in the spring, in case there's a frost, you put the remade over in a little hoop house, like a little tiny one on the ground. Okay. And, and in one of my videos in Jenny's Food Forest, I think, it shows how to use the remade and how healthy the crops are underneath. And then out here, there's no remade out some, and it's only half the size because it protected it from the sun, the heavy sun. It's like a shield. And then the heavy frost. And, and, and uh, that's what you want to look at is using remade on a tiny little hoop house. It runs along the ground. And, uh, hey, he why you look at review? He knows what we're talking about. He grows inside in the wintertime in Washington. Yep. Cheers. He's got a big dome. Yeah, he does. I, saw, I, I noticed that. You get some pretty yeah, good results uh, in there. Yep. Uh, Yep. To answer your question a while ago, Heaven's Essentials, yes, you can just use wood ash and biochar to lime out or to, to base out your oak leaves. If you just layer that together. That's what you're supposed to do. That's what happens in nature. Because the, the, the First Nations in North America would burn the understory and then yep. and then and then they would harvest the rooted crops like camas bulbs and chocolate yeah. lily or whatever it was, you know. Uh, same thing. Uh, but uh, and then that 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 when they burnt that 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 was their agriculture, you know. It's different than what what is today as you're taught to put fertilizer down <laughs> till the soil this way and that that just didn't happen. In California, where she is, she said she's in Central California. A lot of stuff was done through nature with wildfires. Uh, yeah, naturally, it would come through all the time, and that was their you know fertilizer. Yeah, yep. absolutely. Yeah. Yep. And not only that, in California, uh, especially in the in the Bay Area, the Indians used to burn Mount Tamapias and some of the other ones every year, and they had lush green meadows and yep. no weeds, none of this, you know, all this other stuff. That it then, uh, anyways, they, you know, another certain group came in there and screwed it all up, and that's why California has well, that, big that, that, That's why Pathway Soil Bank works because you're replicating what they did. You're building the soil in layers, just like nature. Then at the very end, you're doing your your biochar, wood ash, and lime. So you're just replicating that, seeing that pre-industrial agricultural scene into Pathway Soil Bank. And so you change your regimen, and then you don't have a compost anymore. There's no more compost. There's, uh, you got to get out there. That's a lot of work. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, Torsier Trainer has me laughing over there. Okay, Steve, I won't talk about California. I'll talk about California. Well, <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. Well, yeah, uh, there. Some places are pretty rough. In Northern California, there's there's towns that are just all boarded up. Uh, yeah. Well, the uh, the one thing I wanted to add for sure is. A lot of people are, they, they look at farmers now like they have all the things figured out. Well, most of the farmers now also spray fertilizers and everything else to make sure they have the, the nitrogen, potassium, and uh, phosphorus to make sure they can grow all stuff. They spray it's an NPK formula. Uh, for a long time, especially down south, I know because I go to a lot of these older places, usually when you see a building, like a house or a schoolhouse or whatever, the reason why it was built in the early 1900s is because that field was dead. They didn't know how to farm and they didn't know how to plant things. So they would just keep on planting until the, the field literally gave no more crops. No microbial life. Yeah. The field gave no more crops, they would build something on it because yeah. they could tell why the, the earth would stop giving crops because they, they didn't know how to rotate, they didn't know how to do anything. A lot of this stuff, when it comes to taking care of why you use compost, is still very new. And we're just rediscovering now what the natives had figured out hundreds of years ago by, not even by accident, they just knew from observing nature. Real life. Yeah. 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 Hey, Steve, yeah. he's a trader. That's why he can't talk about it. One, His one wife thing, still lives there. One thing I'd like to talk about, just to touch on a little bit, is nitrogen fixers. It's mm -hmm. plants that take nitrogen out of the air and puts it in the ground in, in nodules. 
And there's two kinds. There's annuals and there's perennials. And in, in permaculture, what they do is they, they the, the, the annual ones, you've got to keep, you know, you plant like it's like peas, beans, that kind of thing. And, and then, and then, and then the perennial one, it just keeps giving, see? Keeps going around in a circle. Uh. Well, it, 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 what happens is the microbes attached to and eat and consumes and degrades and digests the nitrogen uh, nodule. And then that nitrogen now is ready to go on to the mycelium, the super highway of nutrient delivery to all living things in the ecosystem under the ground. That's how it works. And it's really interesting because if, if you have nitrogen fixtures like clover, the farmers put a field of clover in. There's a reason for that. It's a cover crop, but it's also a nitrogen fixation crop. So they don't have to use fertilizer. You're balancing the land. So what I do is I put in uh, cyanosis here and autumn olive and a few other ones that put put the nitrogen in there. And then I'll, what I'll do is I'll cover the place in radishes one year. The whole forest floor is covered in radishes. And the radish is a nitrogen fixer. It takes the nitrogen out of the air and puts it in the soil. So then when you come behind and plant something, on the next crop cycle, you're going to get something, you know. Yeah. Well, what well, says a says a black black eyed peas are a fixer and so is peanuts. Yeah, any kind of legume is a nitrogen fixer. So you want to make sure you're. Uh, that's why you see the the commercial farmers using corn and soybean. That's their only biodiversity because the corn is a heavy nitrogen feeder. And the soybean fixes nitrogen back, so it's their way yeah. of being like, "Oh, look, I'm helping." Yeah. In reality, it's, it needs a little bit more than that. That's why they have to spray. But that was the idea originally when Jimmy Carter's administration decided to start doing uh, corn and soybean. They wanted to try to fix the soil for the, the corn because the corn was the number one crop. Go figure. Yeah. And he was, and and he was a peanut farmer. Their crops, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, nitrogen fixers are, are very important because you're going to get some fat potatoes or fat carrots then. Or you can, like Anthony was talking about, the people that are putting in their NPK, the nitrogen, potassium, and, and you know, you're, 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 you're doing it by the rules kind of thing. But if you go out of the rules and go with nature, you don't have to do all that. You don't have to do all that. You, you add your biochar and your wood ash. You get a biochar maker. And I'll tell you, the biochar, what that does is it grabs a whole oxygen and water molecules and nutrients, and it's able to hold it there for the plant. And then there's other benefits, like the click beetle can't go down there because he doesn't like that biochar. It's rough. See? So that, that, there, there's a lot of, lot of um, going with nature. If you learn it, you're going to make out fine. If you don't learn it, you're always going to have a problem that you're going to have maintenance. You don't want maintenance. Maintenance. I don't weed. I never weed here. I aggressively mulch. Aggressively mow. Mulch. No, mulch. Oh, mulch. The, uh, yeah, I'm an aggressive you, mulcher. One, one thing you really got to pay attention to when you are uh, planting something or you having your plants come up, and if there's bugs attacking it, that's the nature's way of taking out the weak plant. Just like with human beings, whenever humans get sick, it's because it's nature's way of dealing with the uh, immunocompromised person. Same thing with the plant. If you have a lot of skill, uh, if you have a lot of uh, problems with bugs, especially because you'll notice you may plant, say, 10 tomato plants. Well, the bugs don't always go after all 10 at the same time. They usually pick the weakest one first, and then they move on to the next weakest one. If all your yeah, plants of course. Are That's care, nature. Yeah, if, they're, if they're all taken care of and you got your, your nutrients in the soil, you're making sure you're watering all the time, the bugs don't usually come they, they still can, but they don't usually come in the numbers that you're thinking of because you have very healthy plants. Healthy yeah. soil, healthy plants, no big deal. Is so that you want to make sure you're making crop rotation then? You want the crop you want farmer, to they crop rotate. Yeah. To, uh, make the, uh, the soil come back. Swales. Swales hold water, okay, and directs water underground. Now, if you look up swales, and what happens is water comes downhill. We all know that. So what it is, it's a, it's a groove in the land. And then that water stops there and goes down underneath the soil. So you always have water for the plant you're growing or tree. 
It's called a swale. You check it out. And then that's that's what that's what in permaculture we use. So we don't have the water. Obviously, you're going to have the water at a certain point. It's as simple as that. But what you want to plan for is not watering. That's the well. Plan. You also want to say what you're planting and what you're planting because certain locations you might have a little too much water. Like I can't exactly. grow olives. I can't grow olives, or I can't grow uh, a lot of grain in the summertime because yeah. in, the, in the fall we get all of our water in the fall. Grains, especially you know, like your standard wheat, they require it dry when it's time to harvest. So yeah. that's why we can't do it here in the wintertime. Uh, and yeah. a lot of places in the Midwest and in the middle of the country, it gets dry in the fall. That's why they're able to grow so much wheat. So you got to yeah. know where you are, and you got to know your your location because certain Elevation natives, everything. Yeah, your native plants are obviously going to be the ones that are going to uh, like where you're at. So I no, I can't grow tropical here without having certain things well i can't grow rhubarb here either because it's too hot it the heat kills it and i don't matter how much you water it it's going to die yeah yeah grow, the the you could grow that later in the year though right no because it's well a rhubarb is technically a perennial so i have to treat it like an annual if i'm going to grow it i got to grow it in the shade and i got to grow it like not even i've tried to grow it and it dies in july even uh, in the shade it's too hot yeah lots of water yeah and it's just it never seems to catch up divide them every second or third year you take your spade and you put it right through the rhubarb and divide that they like being cut in half and replanted in rich black humus and with if lots above, of sand. if you're above the mason dixon line then yeah absolutely you can totally get away with that I, it's just a little too hot down south so yeah yeah oh yeah it's a cold weather crop for sure mm -hmm. No, there's no doubt about it. And that, that's something to distinguish, too, is uh, there's different types. Like there's an early rhubarb, a mid rhubarb, and a late rhubarb, you see? So if you go with a mid, and the same with, with plums or apples or anything like that. There's early apples, mid apples, and late apples. Same with cherries, peaches. They're all, it, you, you look at it. So when you're, when you're in your area and you only got like, say, a couple months of summer, well, you're going to have to have an, a, 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 an early type of apple there or an early type of cherry. You can't grow mid and late variety there. But you, you, you look at the as early, mid, and late varieties, and that's where the key is when you plant your food forest in your garden. That's well, you also doing. have to pay attention to your, your chill hours. Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. If you don't have it, you're toast. You don't get peaches, man. Because <laughs> yeah, my are my... 400 yeah. 500 chill hours and what that is for those that don't know uh certain trees certain fruit require a certain amount of time below 40 degrees freezing so yeah. like with apples a lot of the colder apples don't work down south because they require 1200 1400 1600 chill hours we don't get that here we get maybe 400 so we have to get apple varieties that are bred to not require so much chill hour so yeah. when you get these apples with the low chill hours it works great here, but try putting that low chill hour up in, you know, Indiana, Michigan, It'll whatever. Work. They don't do well because no. it they try to bud too early. And when they try to bud too early, once they got all their, their chill hours, the buds, the the flowers die in the freeze. You don't get any apples. The tree doesn't survive. So Fine you got to know where you are. That's right. Find what is growing in your area already. And your volunteer is your best friend out of the pathway soil bank. When you build your pathway soil bank, you're going to have tomatoes growing up by itself. Oh, those ones grow by themselves. Oh, let's see what they do. Oh, there's a lemon tree. Oh, or an avocado, wherever you are. Th th that happens to me here. And the one that's aggressive and stays over the winter by itself in the pathway in the spring, that's the one I'm going to pay attention to. Because that's or that apple tree or peach or whatever grew there, it likes it. Oh, okay, it likes it. Oh, that's interesting. And volunteer. Make sure whenever you're you're watering, you don't water. Uh, depending on what it is, uh, you're not watering the foliage. And if you are watering in the evening, you're only spot, you're getting the ground. Yeah. If uh, in the southeast with all the humidity here, you water at nighttime, you're gonna no. get fungal diseases left and right. Yeah. You're not gonna get. Nothing. Yeah, that comes up with. Uh, Course, water right on the foliage. <laughs> hey, Howie, 
Corsair Trainers wants to know how often he can water like a general. Water in the evening so it soaks out overnight. That's the best thing that I've ever done. That way it stays. And then don't, like Anthony was saying, don't don't water your leaves because it's got chlorine and fluoride and whatever else in there. And, 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 and it creates mold and fungus problems. So always water on the ground up to the drip line of the plant. And then if the plant needs to be watered up where the trunk is, well, hey, water it. But if you've built your soil properly in a pathway soil bank and you've got four or five feet of rich black soil there, it's got enough water there for you don't need to water a tree. It's all in how you build that pathway soil bank. Or the, another word for it is hoogle mound. That's another way of looking at it. It's it's very similar, except you build a hoogle mound and you forget about it. Well, you build a pathway soil bank and you can utilize that anytime you want soil. And it's nice soil. And if you want to solarize it, take your pathway soil bank, soil out, spread it out on a tarp. The sun hits it two or three days and it's solarized. And I mean, look how much minerals is in that. It's great. Steve, Making one thing I do here. That. I like to uh, I like to water first thing in the morning because we have it's so hot during the day. That way, the water's got a chance to soak in, and the plants have the water they need to work and survive during the day. Because a lot of people don't know this, but if you have a nightshade like a tomato, pepper, potato, um, tobacco, they grow it. A lot of people don't know that they soak up all their energy during the day, and as soon as the sun goes down, that's when they put on their sky. They're not like a uh, lettuce or something that grow during the light time. They need dark to grow. So when you, they're working all night long. So they need that water first thing in the morning so they can absorb all that energy again. So if you have those, you want to make sure that you're watering first, early, early, early before the sun comes up. That way, if you do get the foliage wet, it doesn't matter because it's going to dry by the time the sun comes up anyway. You're not going to get any disease. Mm -hmm. And keyboards that either runs off the clay layer so that sounds like that's a pretty good deal right there according to what Howie has said well, that's the thing. if you have that red clay you're if you it doesn't matter because it's not going to soak in so that's why you want to make sure you put that biochar the mulch something there so it holds the water so it has a chance to soak in because if you've ever lived in a place with clay and you get that hardcore rain if it rains, it can rain two inches in two hours. Nothing's going to soak in. It's going to slide yeah, it right runs off. Run right off. You need that slow, steady rain. For it to you make a swale, you can trap it. You can yeah. trap so it. If you have, if you have debris on top, it'll trap that water so it's not yeah. running off. Yeah. It's, it's, the, it's the plants and the grasses that take water and bring it down and puts it into the aquifer. That's how it works. If you don't have that, that's why the cedars died on southern Vancouver Island last year. All the water that rains onto the city is piped onto the ocean. Nothing went into the aquifer now for 30, 40 years because everything's being piped away. So you drive around our city, there's all these dead trees because there's no water in the aquifer. No one thought about the swale. All they thought about was put it into a, a, a pipe and send it out into the ocean. That's it. So now they're suffering the consequences of droughts on southern Vancouver Island. There's no water. And the only place where cedars stayed alive was near freshwater springs from the, 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 the Olympic Mountain Range. They went underneath the Olympic Mountain Range, underneath the ground under the ocean, and popped up in springs along southern Vancouver Island. And that's where the only cedar trees live. All other ones died. Yeah. So when you see those four... When you have runoff water, the biggest thing you could ever do is have a swale to capture it. That's beautiful because you're capturing it, you're keeping, it's not running away, and you're not flooding. It's, yeah, it's cedars hold a lot of water. <laughs> we have the water lovers. Well, they, there are certain ones that require uh, that the cedar has a really, really deep tap root. That's why they're really good for windbreaks because, they, yeah, they do yeah. touch a lot of wind. Yeah, well, they're so thousand gallons of water a day. Yeah, they're so deep rooted. That's why you see it yeah. usually around a place that's got a lot of, uh, of water. However, in the comments, uh, Heaven's Essentials made a really good point. You don't want to water during the, the heat of the day because it turns into magnifying glass and it fries your leaves. So Absolutely. you get the spots. 
So yeah. it, it, it sucked for me when I worked nights. I had, to, I had to wake up in the middle of me sleeping to water my plants, but I couldn't water before work because I would burn my leaves. What uh, my wife does, she'll water lightly in the morning. And then at night, just as it's starting to get dark, she'll water lightly again. You know, the, a lot of a lot of the plants she won't water the roses at night, and there's a couple of the plants she won't water at night, but she'll water the other ones. That way, it get out. You know, double. They you know they don't dry out all the way during the day. You know, if they do dry out, they get re-energized for the nighttime, and then uh, get the deeper water water in the, in the morning with a little bit more water added to it. And she, yeah. Well, some uh, <clears throat> some like the dry. I'm just saying, like, yeah. depending on what she, it is, oregano and lavender like it dry. They want that break in between uh, waterings. Yeah, she has her her garden laid out so that she waters certain things, certain places, and okay. stuff at different times. Yeah, you know, yeah. Check out that. Check out her the video I did on it. I mean, it's just it's a, it's a friggin' jungle in her front yard, and it's a jungle in the backyard of all the plants she has going and stuff. Nice. Oh yeah, I'm jumping on there. I got, I had my HVAC go down today, so I had to mm. deal with that crap all day, all weekend. Go figure. Mm -hmm. But what you got, uh, a bear? Mm -hmm. What's up? A bear. A bear that he probably grew bear. right here in his house. Mm -mm. No. What? No, it's from Australia. <laughs> oh, Australian bear. <laughs> Yeah. So you guys, yeah, you got to pay attention to where you are. You got to pay attention to where you are. If you have a lot of humidity, if you're high humidity, you have a really high chance of getting fungal disease. And yeah. you can spray all the fungal, antifungal crap on your stuff you want to. It's not going to help if you water incorrect. Something as stupid as water incorrectly can really nope. ruin clay, everything. So clay, clay in water cuts that mold down. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so uh, no, California needs to stop Northern California needs to stop letting Southern California steal the water from the farmers. <laughs> All right. Um, um, now, now I gotta wait. Now I gotta wait for Steve's comeback. <laughs> reverse osmosis. That's water. If I want minerals in there and stuff, I'll put them in there. I just want good old H2O. And this soaks up sugar, hey, because as the salute goes into you, it acts as a salute to grab the sugar. So if you got diabetes, water's great. I drink a lot of water and I got diabetes. Um, one thing I wanted to hit here, though, while we're talking about bugs, um, you want to consider <laughs> growing scrap plants if you do have bug problems, because there are certain plants that, you, that grow that can take bugs pretty easily. Uh, so say you have um, aphid issues, grow nasturtiums. You grow nasturtium everywhere. That's a trap plant because aphids love nasturtium. They'll, they'll pick that over anything you right grow. Yeah. So next thing you know, like if you have, I have apple trees and aphids love my apple trees. So I just put nasturtiums around the apple trees. They don't go for the apples anymore. They go for the nasturtium. Yeah, so I'm smart. So, I do that too. Yeah, I'm sacrificing tool to make sure my, uh, you know, my tree is, is staying healthy and that's one of the best things I've done so far. Uh, don't forget about doing trap plants because they, you know, things like dill, uh, nasturtium, yeah. certainly like those more than like your annual vegetable plants. So. Yeah, for sure. That's wise to mention that. Um, one thing I like to mention, you can control what's in your realm, but what's outside your realm, you cannot control. That's, yep. my, that's one of the issues that I have with the neighbors with weed and feed and, my God, the things they do to poison themselves. <laughs> but I can't control that realm, yep. see? And when you – And if you try, it grows over into yours, you know? Well, sure. And if they've got uh, unbalanced land, then it'll travel. I've seen, the, I've seen the gypsy moth come over where, like, onto the food forest where I am. But because I've got birdhouses in just about every tree, and I have butterfly moth houses and all kinds of things, it's balanced. The bird takes care of the problem. Well, that's, that's one bird. thing we need to make sure we mention. We need to mention, like, the, the predators because, yeah, you're going to get bugs. And, and there's a lot of things, like you're saying, that you can't stop. You can't stop your neighbors from killing off 
the beneficials. You can't stop your neighbors. So the wasp spraying. and then got the cabbage worm. It's like, oh, yeah. oh, give me a break here. Yeah, you, you can't know? stop all that stuff. So the best thing you could do is you can encourage things. I had to write these down while I was thinking about it. You can encourage things like birds or lizards. And if you're in the south, for sure. One thing I've noticed since I've done it is I've started putting in these little, not say shells, but like cement blocks. But I've uh, broken the piece. So it's basically just like a big clam shell like this. And I put it halfway in the ground and let the toads go under there. The toads, because they stay there during the daytime when it's hot. And then at nighttime, they come out and they eat all the bad stuff. There Since I've go. started putting toads in my garden, I have, my pest population has dropped dramatically. Yeah. So amphibians and reptiles, I keep every lizard I find that the cats try to kill, I throw in the garden and boom. They're yeah. lizards. Thanks for bad. coming, Gene. Yeah. The birds eat the bad stuff. So if you can encourage predators, do it. Wasps. Yeah. Wasps are mm -hmm. your fighters and best friends, especially if you're growing brassicae like the cabbage. Yeah, whatever you, you have out. in your garden, try to you want them wasps. compensate. Yeah, try to compensate for what yeah, the wasps don't know what you need them. in your garden to yeah. kill off the other stuff. And uh, my neighbor killed uh, killed the wasp nest, a big one, you know, a huge one. And that year, I noticed I had a few um, um, cabbage worms. I'm like, why? I never get those. But then I hit I hit it with some extra clay in the water in the early spring next year. I didn't have that problem again, even though that wasp nest never ever came back. Another one established about a year and a half later, and um, and uh, so, but. But people get out there with their wasp killing sprays and go, and I'm like, are you crazy? They're not no. really bothering you, you know. It's just no, no, bad. leave them alone unless they're in your house or something. Then they're bothering you. Know? Don't bother them. Don't bother them. And make make a place for them to go to, and and bees too. You can make bee logs. You 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 cut down a tree and you can hollow it out inside you cut it in half and then you make some a few holes here and there and the bees can come in and out and then around august that's when the queen goes and looks for another place to live hey eh? and she or you know she'll, she'll take off and leave that nest and uh that and you got a place all set up for her she she'll come in and you got honey you just take the log apart you see people have nooks and all that like you know that's great that you're making honey but try to make it look natural in the forest and then it's always there for you you see they do the work and if you do need honey it's right there i can't have honey but some people can i sure like eating it though <laughs> well, yeah, i love it you want to make sure you're bringing in those good stuff like uh, a lot of people don't understand but there's in, in north america the plants that are native to north america they require north american bees the honeybee is not exactly. from north america so when you're wanting to pollinate your tomatoes or your potatoes or uh, blueberries they require a bumblebee or a carpenter bee point yep. blank because they're the so, only ones that can vibrate their wings at a certain pitch to make the pollen yeah. come out of the flower Honeybees can't do it. No. Nope. So uh, when people are sitting there making all these carpenter bee traps and all that, just build something sacrificial that the carpenter bees want to go for, you're good. And bumblebees go on the ground anyway, so they'll be in the ground. The only thing you can out for is your... Um, what's, what's that? You see all the hornets. You want to watch out for your hornets because your hornets will kill your honeybees. So yeah. if you have them, get rid of them. You said hornets will kill honeybees. You're there for you. Yeah. What about yellow jackets? What about too. yellow jackets? Uh, yellow. I don't know if they they leave from yellow jackets, but I know hornets nest the big giant bag one looking ones. Yeah. They make bees uh, run away. So if you have hornets, they will eat bees. bees. Leave them all. You want them all for a food forest that's balanced. And there's 460 types right here where I live of bees. Yeah. Like not just honeybees, but there's some bees so small it can fit on the, 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 the eyelid of another bee. And they live underneath the ground in huge colonies. And uh, there's 460 here. And uh, I don't disturb them. They don't disturb me. And I get tons of fruit. I get way more fruit than I'll ever eat. I have to give it away or sell it. at the, my, I have a little stand 
or I do canning, I give it to family, or I, what if I if I I don't want it to go bad, I ship it to the food bank. Here you go. There you go. Yeah, I don't want I don't want I don't want all the bees showing up and or the I mean sorry the wash showing up and eating the fruit that's gonna fall on the ground. Then I'm not gonna have fun on the property. I want to pick it and utilize it. And sometimes you want to leave a little bit of fruit on the tree for the wasp, but did not very much, or for the birds. Don't take all the fruit and berries off. Leave a few. And believe me, you will have less problems. It's like uh, uh, Queen Anne's lace we have here that leaves some seed on the Queen Anne's lace for, for birds to eat, right? So the bird eats bugs, you see? There's a relationship there that you want to condense and keep, in it, and it's a sweet balance in an ecosystem. And when you have it, you'll see it, and you're like, a revelation will come. Say, oh, that's cool. That's cool. You don't you don't cut down the plant. You leave the odd plant to go to seed, and then you have your beneficial insect showing up. That's mm. that, that's really key. And when and it's going with nature. Never impose your will upon nature. Or you're going to have problems. And I don't mean to get political or anything, but look at the planet right now. It's a pretty big, ugly mess. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't, I'm not, I'm not one. I mean, if you look at my shirt, I mean, I grab the, grab the, the, the black snake, the oil black snake. And water is life. The water is life. You know, I'm a great water conservationist. I love water. I like to go trout fishing. I like to go catch salmon. I don't want, I like the deer to reach down and with his little lip to get a drink. And then if I'm hungry, I'll put the deer on the barbecue. Water's everything. If we can have clean water on the planet, we'll, we'll, we'll be here a long time. Oh, It'll yeah. come to the water. No? I agree with you there for sure. Oh, yeah. If you, if you muck up the water, like, like in Puget Sound here, Victoria puts its entire sewage, everything into the ocean here. Yeah. So this is the first year we just all paid with higher taxes over a billion dollars for a new plant. But all it did was take the solids out. The gray water still went out in the ocean. So I'm like, well, that you know, in nature, that doesn't happen. In nature, it, it, it goes into human manure. Humans and bears are very similar in manure. And what it is, is it's supposed to go onto the land. Same with human human manure it's supposed to go onto the land. And people are like, oh, but they ate these pills or they ate that pill. <laughs> Microbes will break down anything and make it inert. It's as simple as that. Tertiary treatment's great and all that, but I mean it, it's not nature. Once you go out of nature, you got problems. But if you go with nature, you will never have a problem. <laughs> nature doesn't give you problems, you give nature problems. Yeah, that's how it works. I could make your yeah. problem. <laughs> <laughs> you shit on the rock, right? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, another thing oh, is, what is human human manure is pathogenic, okay, in its raw state. And that's what happens when you see a, a, a spinach recall. And they, they're like, oh, it's got this or it's got that on it. It's because the farmer used raw manure. And that's that's why you have it. That's why you're sick and dying with an intestinal bleeding or whatever. Right? It's because he, he was in a hurry and he wants to make the money. Now, if you look after your own human manure and it's all like you just put it in sawdust and in, 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 in the pathway soil bank, it's nothing. Oh, I better go answer that. I've been expecting the call. Be and I'll be right back. All right, everybody got anything before we get out of here? Uh, uh, just, uh, you know, if you don't, if you weren't able to catch everything here tonight, um, you can review stuff, how he said at his channel. Anthony's got some good stuff on his channel about, anyway, he just had a good one on potatoes and, and uh, raising the dirt level for potatoes and stuff, something I didn't know. Um, but uh, you want to, you know, you research your local, University um, Extension Program has a lot of free information on plants for your area that are compatible to help keep pests away. Yep. So you plant this plant, this plant next to that plant, 
and this plant keeps the bugs off your fruit and stuff. Yeah, it's called you companion plant. Plenty of the stuff in tonight. We had a lot of good stuff that we covered. So yeah. if you didn't get all of it, just uh, go back and replay the darn uh, show and uh, catch up and make notes and whatnot because we covered a lot of stuff. Yeah, have, have a notepad and be ready to pause it while you write stuff down. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll be also covering a lot of this stuff as it happens in my garden. So if I do happen to get aphid issues or wash bugs, wash fine bores, whatever, I'm going to plant some things that I usually can't plant because I have issues. I'm going to show people firsthand what that is cool. uh, yeah i think yeah, it'll be a good I look look forward to that then. yeah because you you got some good uh, content you guys make sure you go see uh gill over here and also uh wrong finger anthony down there go check them guys yeah. out yeah tibor just tibor just spo uh, put, posted something really important too i forgot about check with your local co-op they have a lot of great information as well. Oh, yeah. They'll, they'll point you in the right direction. And mm -hmm. last but not least, this guy down here that did mm -hmm. a lot of talking tonight, he's very knowledgeable. Make sure that you go check his. Yeah, there we go. His the, uh, <laughs> yeah. Oh, and uh, there's another there's another channel out there. Um, oh, shoot, I just forgot the name. The one from Wyoming that just joined us uh, the, uh, last night. Um, oh, yeah. Sandy, um, uh, hang on, let me get the name here. I got it right here on my little cheat sheet here, uh, down here to, okay. Suburban Homesteader, Y, uh, W, I mean, W, yeah, w Y, yeah. yeah. Uh, Sandy, Homesteader, Wyoming. yeah, she, um, uh, yep. she, she's going to be teaching at a, um, over there, over there in Wyoming at a, uh, master gardener seminar. So she's teaching at a master garden seminar. She's a master gardener as well. So, um, yeah, check their... Uh, um, um, check her out. Uh, I watched that last video she put out. It was a good one. Yeah, Suburban Homesteader WI. Wow. Cool. Yep, I hope everybody learned some good stuff. And uh, closing, uh, closing statement, Howie. Um, make soil. Yeah. If you make soil, then you can grow something. Food mm -hmm. comes from within the soil. That's all. Mm -hmm. That's it. Oh, and clay and water is your best friend. <laughs> Good night, gentlemen. Good night. It's been a pleasure. It has been a pleasure. Yeah. Remember, you guys, uh, I'll be back on Wednesday at, uh, let's see, 3 o'clock on Wednesday and 5 o'clock on Friday, or 1 o'clock on Friday. Right. And, and and tomorrow night, I uh, got the uh, uh, Tuesday Tactical. We're going to be talking about knives. And we're not, I'm not talking fighting knives. I'm talking all knives, kitchen knives, you know, bread knives. I got a lot know, of the knives. Right, the right showing. knife for the right job. I, I'm I got gonna, a lot of knives I'm going to be showing you guys. I'm going to be totally doing a series on soil. And, I got, and I've got two other organic farms that I'm going to go to. And I'm going to do two different series there over the next month. So All it should right. be an interesting wait. time. It will be a good time. All right. Yeah. Good night, gentlemen. Been a pleasure.